Hey everyone, welcome to the Bridgepoint Podcast. I'm Pastor Matthew Peters, and we're so glad that you joined us today. We have a very special guest, my friend, Randy Dawkins. Randy, welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, Randy, we are so delighted that you came on. As soon as I heard your story and what God had done in your life in terms of bringing recovery from uh, decades of addiction and pain and I, and just showing how God can actually move, I was completely floored. Uh, I remember, guys, the first time I was able to listen to you, Randy, uh, I, I guess we met uh, at the Great Banquet in the spring, and then you were a speaker at the one in the fall that I went to, and it was such a surprise because we, we were allotted 25, 30 minutes to speak, and I think, I think you went for an hour? I, I did go for an hour. And here's the cool part. Nobody cared. No. In fact, it wasn't even long enough. Like we were so riveted by what God had done in your life that I was like, I got to get Randy on and I got to talk to him about it. Randy, tell us some of your story of recovery and the power that God brought into your life for healing. Well, you know, it. when I wrote that talk, changing our environment it took me months to write 25 minutes of talk time and 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 interwinding my story with the guidelines that i had to hit right. with the banquet so i've given my testimony before you know i've at the Porter County Jail, at uh, some of our events. I've been in some uh, recovery centers that just can't believe that a 28-year crack addiction was healed in two minutes of pew time. And I think it was a lifetime in my eyes that 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 I had been looking for a way. I knew the way, but I just didn't want to surrender. I still wanted to do what I wanted to do and 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 go to church on Sunday sometimes. I believed in God. Oh, this is fascinating. So you're you're saying that for much of the time you were using crack and using cocaine and other illicit substances, you had believed in God, but for some reason you were still holding on to that addiction and that use and not surrendering that. Well, you know, when you go to jail, they call it uh, jail religion. You know, you get in the Bible when you get in the pod and right. I was doing Sunday service in jail, praying for a miracle. Was that disingenuous? Was that real? I don't know if it was real or not, okay. but I do know that, yes, it was real at the time because I knew who God was and I knew what I was doing wasn't the right thing to do. I just couldn't help myself. I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. Even through all the people I heard along the way, my mother, my old pastor, uh, friends, neighbors, sisters, and brothers, you know, all those people that you that you those relationships that you that you the bridges that you just burn from drug addiction or any other substance abuse addiction so i remember you saying that like you would you had been incarcerated and i can't remember how many times you've mm -hmm. been incarcerated but you were incarcerated for a period of time in prison yep. and then you get out and you said like that day you went out to smoke crack that like, day. What was going on in your mind? Do you remember the thought process that you went through that, that were like, I'm going to go smoke crack, even though that put me in the clink. Well, I mean, I would tell me why I would go out on uh, on probation, a formal probation and use the night before I had to uh, give a uh, drug screen and no, I had to do it but still use in, in hope that that maybe it would be a different result. And then I'd get a violation of probation or a revocation here or a revocation there. I mean, I would 
uh, it's just the cycle of addiction. It, it, d- it didn't matter to me. I, my my thought process wasn't a normal thought process. It was a drug induced thought process. Wow. So you know, just between me and you, you probably don't know this about me, but I I used to abuse um, nicotine regularly. I would chew tobacco. I'd smoke cigarettes. I smoked a pack a day. Um, if I could smoke more, I would have. Uh, but just prohibitive, like not enough, not enough uh, areas where I could smoke in the day. Right. <laughs> you know, like I, I smoked Marlboro Reds and I was proud of it. And I thought light cigarettes were a joke, you know. And I remember um, wanting to quit and trying to quit and, you know, going for a few hours or going for a few days and then some stressor would hit. And I'd flip my lid and I'd have a nick fit. Or and later in my life, I, I developed a I, and it wasn't always like this, but I developed ch- drinking habits. Yes. And I was very sophisticated in my ability to hide my drinking. But my wife knew I was drinking too much. Yes. And some of my friends knew I was drinking too much. Right. But I was the guy that like the more I drank, the better I worked. You know, like I, I was able to compartmentalize my life. Like I knew, OK, if I'm going to do this here, then I got to really work hard over there. Right. And I remember trying to quit. And thinking, I can quit any time. I'm, I'm fine. And then I tried. And what ended up happening was I would have this weird thing that would happen to me where something would come over me and I would just know that I wasn't going to make it. I knew that, like, by the end of today, I would be drinking. Right. And, and it was like, it was almost like it was not a thought process. It was like... Uh, uh, something that was deeper inside of me. And I've been doing a lot of reading on this. Yes. And they say that like a lot of the things that we do for addiction are based in trying to cover very deep, painful things that happened developmentally when we were younger. And that when we get into this place of addiction, it actually doesn't reach to the level of logical thought. It's completely illogical. It's deeper than that. It's like a fight or flight syndrome. You're not thinking about like relational context or whether you're going to hurt that person or whether this is a good idea. And I listened to your story about like using the night before you're going to have a drug test seriously and hoping quote unquote for a different result. That's not logical. That's so in other words, what I'm trying to say is what God did in my life and your life. Yes. was a radical miracle. It was, you know, when I would use, I would, drink to counterbalance the effects of the of the crack and uh it was a cycle of addiction i mean from i mean i wasn't a uh the word i'm looking for is i wasn't you know uh where you can you can work every day and you can still do the drugs every day and you can uh, I, I couldn't do that. You I were not functional. No, I, I wasn't. I was functional in the end. But in the beginning, I didn't care who I hurt, the money I stole, the oh, checks wow. I wrote. I would just steal to get. I couldn't keep a job. I, I couldn't keep a car. I couldn't keep, you know, I, I, I had, I would pawn everything I had week to week. And then I I, I was just not, not, uh, once I started using crack in uh in October of 94 I never turned back from that time I mean I I used all my money went to it uh I I I had a marriage in another state that didn't last long with you know there was just a lot of trouble in in another state and and then I came back home on a Greyhound bus with nothing and and then it just started again and that was that was uh that was well I left in 95 and then I came back was in this 04. was this when you were working offshore yes and you were yes. like taking a helicopter to work yes. or something yes I was and so your your life cycle then was like work my tail off and the moment I finish work I get to go smoke crack yes when I came back I my whole my life was consumed my life was consumed and I mean, I heard people here and I heard people there, my father there. I mean, I ended up coming back in 02 is when I came back, 03, on a Greyhound bus with nothing. 
he put me on a bus and he said, you're going home. I mean, you're going to go to jail. They are not here. And he was right. I mean, by uh, 04, they uh, they were they came to my house and arrested me on on multiple felony f- charges for for forgery, for theft, for everything. Yeah. And yeah. and were you going to church at this time when you were out or were you? Only- I was. I was working for a pastor. I was working for my pastor at the time. And did he know you were struggling he did with not. addiction? He did not. I wow. hit it. I hit it. I hit it well. I would. I was functioning then, hiding it. But it got to a point where I was out of money. Then I would steal and rob and forge to uh, to cover my uh, addiction. To and were you, buy were more. you were you seeking reliefs from this, or were you just trying no. to suppress it? You didn't want no, God no, to change no, it. No, no, I didn't ask. For I mean, I was just, I, I didn't ask for nothing. I mean, I wasn't at the bottom, I guess. You know, I wasn't at my the bottom of where I needed to be. So uh, then I got and picked up my charge and ended up uh, in the county for six months at a time. And then I'd get out and use that day and revocate and go back in and revocate. And finally, the U.S. Marshals were looking for me and they were all over because I had revocations in Blake County, Jasper County, Porter County, because I had forged lots of checks. Can you explain revocation? Revocation is when you're on probation and you do something to revocate your probation. Okay, you, so you're violating You're your violating your okay. probation, and they give it's called a revocation. But And they gave me a sweet deal. I mean, I had all these charges. They called it a crime spree, and I prayed, in, and I was in jail, and I was with in the Bible and Lord singing songs and, you know, and being in Bible study with men in the pod. And I was, yeah, I mean, God, if, the devil knew when I was there that he really couldn't subliminal message me with anything because I couldn't get it anyway. So I'm all with this and I'm sold out to the moment I leave. I got that deal that I've been praying for. They Put, ran everything together. It was a crime spree, and all the counties agreed that if I would just finish Porter County's uh, probation, that they would all go away. Everything would go away. And that day that I came came home, I used that day. Wow! After half a year, I had it in three hours. Mm-hmm. Wow! I did. And was that on your? Was that a plan? Did you make? A it plan? wasn't a plan. You just went home. I didn't even think about like, it till after I left. Till all the stuff hit the fan, and you were like, what? "Nothing hit the fan." I just nothing went home hit and got the it. fan. You no, just, just decided. Just decided. Wow. Just decided. Gosh. Just decided. And this destroyed all of your relationships. It destroyed your relationship with your wife, with your pastor, with your mother. Oh yeah, they everything was pretty much. But my mother allowed me to stay there. My mother was, uh, she was a saint. She loved me. She, if you ever have unconditional love, I mean, I did so many things to my mother, then she would regret some of the things she said, but she'd say some pretty mean things to me about, I'd wished you'd never been born and all that, how many times you hurt me. And, but she never, she always did for me and she did for my son who I had at the time. And, uh, yeah. So that, that stayed on eventually. I revocated and I was arrested and went to prison. So, and I stayed in prison for a little while and uh, stayed in the county for about a year, in Porter County, and got out. And I I used the day I got out. I used the day I got out. I had a deal. I had a friend that still was using and I started using and that was in 06. And I had started in 90, 94. So, that that's a decade and a couple years, but I I used and used and used. I can every. I mean, I was functioning then. I had a job, so I would function, but use every day. Now I'm not sugarcoating anything. I would use till four or five in the morning every day, every day, every day in the bathroom, every day with the door shut, praying that you know my heart didn't explode. I would just pick up the and break a million pipes out the window, but use every day. The next day, go back and buy another one. No wow. sense in that every day. So, and I had started that. I was drinking at 14 little Kings back in uh, the seventies and eighties. And so I struggled. And when I was in the Navy at, at 17, 
I was drinking so much uh, Uzo, that's uh, the opium-based alcohol over in Greece and all the other ports that I went to. I was a drunk for four years. So coming out at 21, I became a drunk then, just sniffing cocaine. So this started at 17. Wow. Mm -hmm. So much time went by. Yeah, well, about 40 years. Now, at any time, did you try to quit? I quit for for sh- brief times, days, you know, but and then when I went to jail I was quit because I was forced to quit, but yeah. I was never uh I never intentionally wanted to use like I mean, I, when you throw a pipe out the window the night before and you think like I felt bad, I felt bad about where I got the money and about what I had done in my past. I mean, it was I have I have a deep dark past with yeah. a lot of people, my children and my first wife, then my second wife, yeah. and now I'm remarried to my first wife again. So That's a whole crazy story yeah, which it is. We, we should we should share in just a little bit, but I you know, it's really interesting. I was I've been doing a lot of reading yeah. on addiction yeah. and the brain chemistry of it and the science of it. And one of the things that an author that I was reading, this gentleman named Gabor Mate, okay, he's out of Canada, um, and not a Christian, but has some interesting points of view about it. He defines addiction not the way I thought addiction should be. Addiction, I thought, was something that you would have some kind of chemical dependency so that you either, uh, you mentally and psychologically and physically would be... Uh, goes through some kind of horrible withdrawal. Mm. And he defines addiction as a repeated behavior in order to cover past pain that you will do despite its negative consequences. I think that you forget about the negative consequences. Once you leave jail, it's just days that you forget about. It's easy to forget about the last year that you were locked up to right. use again. It just if You forget about it. So. But this is totally irrational. Yes. Right. Like, for example, I'll just give you a really simple example. OK, so my wife and I, we were married. OK, and I was in graduate school and we were dirt poor. I mean, bro, I couldn't even afford a cup of coffee. The people in the faculty lounge knew how poor I was and they gave me the free faculty coffee. Amen. OK. Amen. <laughs> OK. And I said to my friend, Mark, I said, Mark, I'll never be able to afford beer again. I like beer. Okay. I just drank, you know, right. and he's like, you'll be able to afford beer someday. Right. So I finally said to my wife, I can't take it. I don't want to live on ramen noodles anymore. I'm going to, we're just going to get steak this weekend. So we get steak and I make the steak cause I'm, I'm a pretty good cook. Okay. Right. And I fried the steak in this stainless steel oven proof pan and I seared it on both sides, and then it was a thick steak, and I want to finish it in a 450-degree oven right. for a few minutes so that Ooh. it's medium rare. Yes. Okay? So I put the oven mitt on, and I grab the, 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 the pan out of the oven. It's 450 degrees, mind you. I set it on the counter. I take the oven mitt off. I do something over here, and then I reach over and grab the pan. I heard it, and I smelled it, the burning flesh, before I felt it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I was crying and nursing gigantic second degree burns. Right. And then several months later, I went and I did it again. Okay. Now people can laugh at me all they want, but I've never done it since. And here's the reason why, because I remember the pain. And every time I do that, I get out a towel and I put that towel over the pan when it comes out the first thing and I don't move it. And if someone grabs the towel, I get very agitated and say, put it back. Right. But this is not the way addiction works. No, it's not. We, we like I, re- I remember one time uh, driving and I don't know how I got home. I was driving and I'm, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I, I was I started drinking sometime before lunch and I kept drinking until like three in the morning. I don't remember half the things I was up to. Um, and s- people tried to take my keys from me cause I said I wanted to go home and I didn't want to sleep at this person's apartment. And there was, you know, a lot of people there and everybody was partying and I wanted to go home. So they said, no, you, 
you can't go home. They try to take my keys and I watched them and pretended that I was asleep. And then I took the keys and I started driving home and, and it was like, um, I don't know if people will know this. You'll probably know this like old time televisions where you got, uh, you didn't have a digital reception. You got an ad, ad antenna. Mm -hmm. And like, if you didn't get a very good signal, there was like a black line that the mm -hmm. whole TV would just like blip. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the whole picture would blip. And then the, the bottom picture would be half of the top picture yeah. as it was blipping up. Mm -hmm. And that's what the world was doing to me. Blip, blip. And I was weaving all over. And I finally was like, I'm going to crash this car. I have to stop and have a cigarette. So I pull in this target parking lot. Okay. And I roll down the window and I start smoking the cigarette and in the target parking lot pulls a cop and he parks right next to me. Now I am like almost passing out, mind you at this point, cause I'm so tired and I'm so inebriated yes. and I just casually smoked my cigarette and then rolled the window up and put the radio on and just, it was like, uh, 5.30, 5.45 in the morning. It was still dark, right, by this time. Cop finally leaves me alone, finally decides I'm not going to mess with this guy because he can't make me drive. He drives. So I drive home. I park, and I'm walking into my apartment, and I'm, like, staggering, and the sun is coming up. And then I went into my apartment, and I laid down, and the next thing I knew, my friends who were Christians were coming in and waking me up. And of course I had the hangover for, of all hangovers. And they said, Hey, Hey, you okay? I'm like, I'm all right. They're like, you didn't get up for church. We want you to go to church with us. <laughs> and I said, and I looked at him and I had this terrible splitting headache, but I got out. I was like, how did you get in? And they go, the door was open. Hmm. Like, I didn't even remember to shut the door. You know, I don't know how, like, I don't know how God preserved me. And then I had another time where God specifically told me that I should quit drinking, but I didn't, but I had it under control. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, uh, well, I thought it was under control. Right. You know, my family would have told you and some of my close godly friends would have told you I didn't have it under control. Because once I started, there was no shutoff spigot. And I would carefully plan the evening so that I didn't have to have a shutoff spigot. I wouldn't have to drive home drunk or any of that stuff. I'd try to figure things out. And uh, I was told by God, by a friend, my friend came to me and he said, you need to cut out all drinking. I said, it's fine. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm okay. I'm not doing any of this bad stuff. And he said, you, you're not, you're, you need to listen to God. You should not drink. And I didn't listen to him. And I actually got a tremendous job offer. Uh, I went through six months of interviews. I went to all these dog and pony show parties because that's what they do to you as a pastor. They, they bring you in. They, they, they have little parties where you eat hors d'oeuvres and have dinner with people right. and they get to watch you. Right. you know? And everybody liked me and all this stuff. And, and the elders of this church, they actually brought, they found out what my favorite Belgian beer was and they brought that beer to this dinner gathering and they served me this beer. Mm. And my assessment was, is that the elders were drinking at this church and there were some people that didn't like it. And they chose my back as the battleground in order to fight with these elders. Right. So they told me, you got the job, just come back uh, for the final weekend. And I said, well, I was planning on going to Disney World if I got a job. I, we've saved up for many years. They said, go to Disney World. When you come back, you'll have a job. And I came back and they said, so sorry the whole thing fell apart these people they don't like that you brew beer and drink beer and um they don't want a pastor who's into alcohol mm. and i knew man i knew the holy spirit said to me i i asked you to obey me i told you that you were to be filled with my spirit not with substances not with mm. alcohol and that was a severe discipline from god now if that hadn't happened I wouldn't be here today. So all things do work out for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Even when we rebel, God can bring grace out of that. Amen. But like I had to, I had to have, I had to have God really speak to me. Um, and then the time I quit smoking was a long time ago. I remember I just 
I, we went to a Beastie Boys concert when I was in college. And I had been smoking and we'd been out all night and I stayed over at my friend's house and I got up in the morning and I don't know what happened, but when I was smoking this cigarette, I had this thought that I was inhaling my own death. And so I literally just said, I got to quit. And then the voice, there was like, this is a conversation I had with myself and the voice was like, I said, me, I said, well, I'll just finish this cigarette. It'll be my last one. And then this other voice, and I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or my conscience or what, said, that's not quitting. Quitting is quitting now. Because if you don't quit now, then you can't quit later. You got to quit now. So I just flicked the cigarette. I had only taken a few drags of it. And, you know, I haven't gone back to smoking since. But what I did do is go back to other tobacco products. Mm. And I had to finally come to this recognition where I was like, Lord, I need you to be God over this. I need, I'm, I can't lean on this. I can't, I can't find this substance as the thing that, that brings me a little kick or brings me some peace or as a place of little, my own little private island where I go for solace. And God is basically saying to me, no, I need to be your all in all. And I finally was like, okay. And so I, I just said, God, I'm going to obey you. And I quit. That's what it looked like for me. And I've not gone back to alcohol, and I've not gone back to tobacco. It's very good. It wasn't, I mean, it's, when I, when I got out of prison in 2005, the winter of five, uh, I lived with my mother, and I continued to drink and smoke crack every day uh, for the next six years, six or seven. Uh, so all in all, it was uh, 17 in crack and then 10 in uh, the cocaine, so 27. But the alcohol, I mean, I drank even if I wasn't smoking crack. And getting to the my deliverance a little bit my first wife her name is Dina she would she wanted her marriage back she had been married divorced just an annulment fast marriage so we had married young and had a son and he's a prosecutor now I don't figure but he's a prosecutor and uh she laid a plate out for me at the dinner table and her and her younger daughter, Jenna, would walk around the table praying what God told her, his promises, how, you know, that she could get what she asked for and that not to give up. Just like a prodigal son, I was a prodigal husband. So you were gone. I was gone. You were out MIA. MIA. Who knows? She didn't know where you were. Well, she knew where I was because we have a son in common. She knew... She didn't know that I was... Uh, but you weren't doing well. Oh, I was And so doing. she was setting a place... Yes, she in was. ...in your absence... Yes. ...and praying over you. Yes, That's she was. fabulous. She was. And she, she saw that the love boat captain had laid a plate out for his wife or vice versa. She saw it off the 700 Club. So she said that she was going to do what he did. And she did the same thing for nine months. And then nine months later, we started to, it was my son's birthday. We got together, and this was in 2010. And I was still using daily, and we were seeing each other. But I knew I was able to cover it and hide it. I would do it at home at my mom's because she, she let me. She knew what I was doing. She just enabled me or whatever, but she, she didn't say anything. But she had her suspicions, I'm sure. And... I kept using, and then things just got more serious with me and her. I could hide it, and one day I just asked, you know, I was going to church with her but still using, Yeah. and she said, uh, I asked her, would you marry me again, and she said yes, so we set a date, uh, November the 12th of 2011. That was our date. That we were going to remarry. 
but I know because the first time we were married, I was heavy into cocaine, hmm. and we were divorced within two years. And I know that my second marriage ended because of crack cocaine. I knew that this marriage wouldn't last a week. How could I smoke with her Right. in the bathroom? She wouldn't immediately know, and there would be an annulment. And I knew I had went on a binge, and it was the day before our wedding. I went away for three days, smoked in a motel. I mean, all my money was thought it was gone and stuff like that. And uh, I knew that of probation, parole, uh, my children, my mother. If nobody could make me stop, not even myself, that that there'd have to be something higher than myself. God, right, would be the only deliverance for me. Yep. And I did everything bad when the drugs were just a part of my life. My character was bad. My credit was bad. I had everything I've ever owned repossessed. Wow. Every car I've ever owned repossessed. I never did anything right. Never, ever, ever, ever. I lost my first car to repossession. I lost my motorcycle to repossession. I never owned anything. I mean, I never owned a house. I never owned anything. And I was uh, 49 years old. So, and I knelt down in my mother's living room the day before a wedding. And I just prayed. I prayed. I knew how to pray. But it's in the Lord's timing. And why I wasn't dead before that, all the nights where I couldn't even breathe and the stress that it put on my heart, smoking day in, day out for six years. So it's like, and the two packs of cigarettes I smoked, because that's what you do when you do that. You smoke cigarette. You put one out, you light up another one. Yeah, chain smoke. Oh, I chain smoked. Carton every three days. So. Oh, my pack a day was just child's play. Oh, it was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that when I prayed that prayer, I said, Lord, if you'll take this addiction from me you know I had said it before and I had thrown a million pipes away like I said I had and everything's in the details with me there's got to be details dates and stuff like that because God is always in the details I believe that the way that he had things made they were detailed the the, the, the cat Solomon's uh, home was in the detail uh, the Noah's Ark was in the detail. So I'm always about details. So I know what I did. I know how long I did it. And I know when I was this and when I was that. And I know the morning of November the 11th of 2011, I asked God to take that addiction from me. Mm -hmm. And I had been to rehabilitation centers for a week trying to keep myself out of jail from violation of my probation I had been, I had done everything. There was no way that I was ever going to do that on my own. There was no way without pulling, putting a bullet to my head. There was no way it was ever going to stop. I identified in it. It was my identity. It's what I did since I was 17. I mean, that's what all addicts struggle with. It's part of their DNA. It's who they are. It's what the devil makes them believe who they are. Yeah. But it's not true. I didn't see a brighter side on the other side of uh, the rainbow. I didn't see anything that would, I didn't, there was no reason for me to be anything than what I was a drug addict because there was no joy in my life. Mm. What I thought was joy was just fake joy. It was drugs and alcohol and all like that. I was happy with that. So, that morning, I was delivered. 
instantaneous that I felt something come over me uh, and touch me and where I knew it, it's like, I've got this, I've got you and I'm gonna restore you. I'm gonna restore your marriage. Everything that the devil's taken from you, I'm gonna give back. I'm gonna show you joy like you've never seen before. Hmm. And I felt this peace come over me that day. And uh, I didn't use that day no more. It was gone. I felt different. The next day I got married. She never knew I used. And that day, I didn't I didn't smoke a cigarette, didn't drink. I didn't smoke crack. And uh, that day turned into a week. And that week turned into a month. And we started in church and, and men's group. And, uh, you know, and I started just believing in God's promise, what he said that day. I believed that he healed me. And I gave him all the credit for that. It wasn't in my doing. It was in him. And those months turned into a year. And I was like, I don't even have a desire, not a trigger. Not money wasn't a, a trigger for me. A lighter was a trigger. Money was a trigger. Alcohol was a trigger. I just said, well, I'm not going to do any of it. I'm not going to drink another drop. I'm not going to smoke another cigarette. I'm not going to do any of it. I mean, wow. my life is going to be different. And uh, all those things went away. And that year turned into two, it just turned into five, turned into 10. And I just celebrated my 11th year of no drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. Awesome. 11 years. Praise God. So, and uh, from, a, from, a, from a childhood at 17 to, to where I was almost 49 years old, my, half my life was gone to drugs and alcohol. Wow. And uh, God did more than that. He he fixed my character. I mean, I just can't say that he just fixed me in drugs and alcohol. My friends, they can trust me. When I say I'm going to do something, I do it. My credit now is I could buy anything I wanted on credit. My credit score is over 800. <laughs> Uh, my love, bills have been paid. Keep talking, Cohen. <laughs> my bills have been paid on time for the last eight years. I've never missed a payment. Mm. I was meticulous credit. I, I journal. I write down everything that I do. Uh, I, 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 I'm months ahead in all my bills. I have a savings. We just bought a, a rental income across the street. We sold a house we had in Gulf Shores, Alabama, coming from a guy that couldn't keep $5 in his wallet the day after payday. I own two properties now. I mean, I'm the main guy at work. I mean, they say they have to hire two if I was ever to leave. I mean, I have favor in every area of my life with my boss. I mean, with people. I mean, it's like everything that I do. I mean, it's always good. And it's always like, but it's all about God. Isn't it though? Yes. It really is. It is. There's a couple of Proverbs that are coming to my mind and I, I, I'll quote them. I, I don't know where they are. Right. One is, show me a man skilled in his labor and I'll show you someone that works before kings. Now, just hold on to that. Right. Okay. Then in the earlier in the Proverbs, it's Proverbs chapter three, something or others says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding right. in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Right. And when you started saying, God, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to give up the God of crack and I'm going to follow you, Lord Jesus, and surrender my whole life to you. Right. Then. He gave you everything that you needed. I still struggle. I still have my, like, I mean, like my, the way that I was is my, my personality. Like there's things in my life, uh, the, like, I feel like, uh, there's no value sometimes in my sense of like 
how people view me or see me at church, you know, the things that maybe as a child that I've dealt with, I still mm-hmm. deal with, yeah. you know, like uh, just, but it's not in those areas anymore. And, you know, I've been asked to be part of a jail team. Now, I was in the county, uh, the Porter County Jail for a while, uh, giving back to the community and the God Pod when it was open for God works everything out at the right time and the right people come into your life at the right time. The people that used to mentor me in the county ended up giving me their ministry in Porter County. And I was able to go in there and be part of the God pod. And uh, they closed and I became a youth leader at the church with the youth and uh, getting ready to start a LaPorte County thing for a minute and doing the uh, Indiana Dunes Great Banquet and stuff like that. Always... working at my faith you know faith without works is dead and work without faith you show me works i'll show you your faith show me your faith and i'll show you your works works. so and i believe that i believe like you know i believe that you know people are kind of sure sinners and we we don't go into a glorified body till we breathe our last breath right and we'll be repenting every day so and anybody that says they won't they're not they're not they're lying to themselves so one of the things I find remarkable about your story is that, uh, well, not just the fact that it lasted so long yeah. and that it had such a dramatic uh, crescendo end, if you will, to the addiction. Yeah. But um, I don't know, for many years, just I guess maybe it's just me uh, as a public speaker, a pastor, um, a counselor. I always wanted to be the change agent in people's lives. I always wanted to say just the right thing that was going to help them not want to use anymore. And I finally come to this conclusion after listening to your story and after just processing for years and years, uh, no one can change another person. No. Your mom couldn't change you. Your wife couldn't change you. Your ex-wife couldn't change you. Your dad couldn't change you. All the bosses in the world who told you to clean it up couldn't change you. All the people that had conversations with you couldn't change you. The only person that could change you was God. Amen. And and of course, there's a cooperation with that, right? There you could say to no to God. Yes. But I guess one of the things I think I want people to find an appropriate place of connectivity and hope with your story. OK, Now, here's where I think people should not or what they should not do with your story. OK, look for some dramatic experience and model their story after you or try to orchestrate this for loved ones so that they have this intervention moment where they would change. Now, I'm not trying to direct everyone what they should do, but I think that people have this false notion that they should be generating or creating this catalytic moment the way you've experienced so that they so that someone would never want to use again. And frankly, I think the person who's the hero in your story, besides God, is your wife. Amen. That's what I was just going to say. Because what your wife did was the right thing. Yes. She said, I'm going to love this man and I'm going to pray for this man. Yes. Now, your mother, I don't know your mother, okay? And it sounds like she did her best. She did. But I kind of think she's also a hero in the story. She is. Because you said something earlier that I thought was remarkable. You said, my mom loved me unconditionally. Right. Now, I can't speak to whether or not your mother set appropriate boundaries. My point is not to criticize your mother. My point is to compliment her and say, what is it that we can do? Okay. So I just pick up a dear friend of mine who has been on and off opiates and heroin for. Well, he started when he was 15 and he's like 37. So 22 years. Yeah. And I hope to have him on the program. And while he was in prison, I was communicating with him and I was telling him about you. And I was telling him about your story. And the way in which I told him your story was that if this individual could be on drugs longer than you and God could deliver them, there's hope that God can deliver you if you submit yourself and give yourself completely to him. Yes. 
And as far as I know, he has. And I think he's been clean for like, I don't know, not quite a year. And he just got out on Thursday and I'm connecting with him and I'm caring for him and I'm trying to set the right boundaries, but I'm constantly pointing him to God and I'm constantly saying two things. I'm praying for him on the one hand and I'm trying to offer him unconditional love on the other. I don't give him $10, right? But I don't reject him. I don't call him an addict. I try to give him love. And I think the people in the story in your life, besides obviously God, he's the superhero, right? He is the superhero. But he he was living in and through your your mom and your wife. He was. And I don't have I met your wife? Yeah. She was like at one the, time, uh, right? She was at fourth day and stuff like yeah. that. And you saw my wife there and stuff like that. She so was part of everything. what would you like to say to people just as we begin to think about wrapping up? Like what would you like to say to people, uh you know, NA and AA and Celebrate Recovery and all those uh, all those programs, Frontline and many others, they all work if you apply the principle behind it. Uh, you know, the 10 steps, yeah. you know, and but it may not work for everybody. They may not get anything from that. And then they're going to have to search deep down inside themselves and kind of do a, the self-evaluation of their life. And, I mean, some might only be struggling a year or two under their addiction. Or maybe people are, uh, and it doesn't have to be drugs and alcohol. It can be a lot of addictions. Right. Any addictive Gambling, personality. Gambling, pornography, yes. Yes. eating. Yes. yes. I met someone who was addicted to shopping. Yes. She'd go buy $10,000 worth of sweaters. You'd be like, you got to be kidding me. You don't have the money for that. I stole someone's credit card to do it. Yes. True story. So... I mean, and can I say that my life today is, uh, it's not different because of my possessions. It's different because the way I see the world and I see my life and I see Jesus Christ. It's because of the miracle that he did for me that I'm able to be able to speak out to other people. And I can say, when I go to uh, the God pod or I go to the county and they say, well, you've never walked in my shoes. And I say, well, I have. I have walked in your shoes. I have been to prison. I have been in a 20-something uh, year addiction. I know what it is to be an addict. I know how you think because I thought the same way. Right. But and then it's just rebooting myself. I don't think about crack anymore. I don't think about the drugs anymore. I leave my past behind. But I still remember it. I remember the things I did to people. I still remember because I don't ever want to forget it. Hmm. I want to remember that what I was and what God did for me, yes. what he did for me, what he did for me. And, uh, and I always want to serve. I'm a server. I mean, if you ask me to be part of something that's got anything to do with Jesus, I'm in. I'm in. You know, th this is this has been a remarkable thing for me while I was drinking and while I've seen other people in addictions, they and I don't mean this in a rude way. OK, but addiction is inherently self-focused. You cannot pay attention to someone else when you are chasing an addiction and feeding an addiction. You are trying to get a substance for yourself. You're trying to get the resources to get that substance for yourself. You don't have any time for your church. You don't have any time for your family. You don't have any time for your community. That's right. And then what's so remarkable is that that is utterly unsatisfactory. It is like a hole, that, that like a, a bucket that has holes in the bottom of it that you can never, ever pour enough in that it just leaks right out. And then as soon as you come to Jesus, he says, come follow me. Yes. And he says, I did not come to be served, but to serve yes. and give my life as a ransom for many. Yes. And then you follow Jesus and you start serving people. And here's the crazy wacko thing. It's awesome. It's awesome. It feels great. And Jesus says it's better to give than to receive. And I used to live in this cuckoo, messed up, self-centered world where I thought, okay, I'm going to give, I'm going to give Randy something today. Yes. And let's say I give him a dollar 
that means God's going to give me like $2 tomorrow, right? Because it's more blessed to give than receive. I still didn't listen to what it said. It doesn't say it's blessed to receive by giving. Right. No, it says more blessed to give than receive. And when we begin to give and pour our lives out, we find meaning, we find purpose, we find satisfaction. Amen. We understand our identity. We're like, wow, I actually did something that's wholly wholesome. No questions asked, no argument. I can go to bed, wake up the next day, think about what I did and go, yeah, that was still a really good idea. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and 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 I and I've seen you, Randy, serve the community right. and serve me and make such a him, impact in my right. life. Right. And I don't mean this in a weird sort of way, in a good way. Like I, you're inspirational. Yeah. yeah. Like that's 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 just beautiful. What how you are choosing to surrender and obey God and become a servant is is brilliant stuff. You're making people happy all over the place because you're you're pointing them to serve the living God. That is just phenomenal, awesome stuff. It doesn't matter what age you are. You can be in your 60s. You can be in your teens yeah. struggling, but God will do what he says. His word never comes back void. Everything that it sets out to do, it does. And... Right. uh He's just, I mean, my life is centered around, I don't watch bad TV. I listen to Christian music. Not that I'm any better than anybody else. I am not. But I want my life to be about him. And when it comes that time, I want to be the wheat and not the tear. I, I, I want to be the wheat. And I yeah, pray man. that all the time that, Lord, I do things in your name. But am I the wheat? So and sometimes... You know, we got to check ourselves and we have to be able to, you know, you know, we have to be able to walk the walk if we're going to talk the talk. Yeah. I had one mm -hmm. other proverb that I was thinking about when you were talking about your years and years of addiction. Yeah. Um, and again, I can't remember where it is, but when I, I remember one time, an old pastor and I think people, he was the guest speaker that day and he came in and nobody knew who he was and he wasn't famous and he was the most humble pastor. I expect him to see on the dais in heaven yeah. with Jesus, yeah. right? This kind of guy. Yep. One that everyone else thinks, oh, he's no big deal. And Jesus is like, you have no idea how awesome this guy is, okay? Mm -hmm. So he preaches this sermon from this proverb. Again, I can't remember the reference. It says, for those who are hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. Amen. And it's like when our souls are hungry because it's not been satisfied with the honey of the word of God, and that's not the, just the Bible. That's a supernatural Holy Spirit relationship with the living God. Right? Right. Right. When we're hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. Pornography, alcohol, gambling, crack cocaine. Right. Pick your addiction. We're hungry, and this is bitter, and yet we're deluded into thinking that it's sweet. But then once we get the honey... We're like, what was I doing? What was I doing? It's like we have <laughs> scales over our eyes until they're removed. I mean, my eyes were blind to, I knew what I was doing, but I had no way to change. And and once I stepped out of myself and it took a while to see that my the joy that I have today is better than any any week of being high in my life. I mean, that I can finish strong. Do you know what I like? I like, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a negative illustration and then I'm going to bring in the positive and then maybe we can close, okay? Right. So I've, I'm not an expert, okay? I don't know everything, but I've often sat with people while they, while they were high and them just tell me lies, just bold-faced lies. You know, them saying, I'm completely sober. And you're like, so why is your... Why is there a pinprick in your arm that's bleeding and your eyes are more like that little needle hole in your arm? Mm -hmm. No, that's nothing. You know, like they hide it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm not, I'm, I'm sober. And you're like, no, you're not like, you don't fool me. You know what I mean? Right. I sat down with a guy the other day and he was high and, uh, and I didn't know what he was high on, but I knew it, you know, and later I found out what it was and I was like, oh, that's why it was unique because it was something like different. Right. I remember sitting down with some kid. His dad wanted me to meet with him. He couldn't put a sentence together. Yeah. You know, 
and I, I just have been with people a lot and they, 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 they don't fool me in terms of their, their addiction. And I see all these things. And when you, when you know what, what a person who's high on various drugs looks like, yep. you can just see it. Or if they're not high, right, when they're walking around like a ghost the next day when they're coming off their drugs, you can just look at these people on the street and go, you use drugs and I know what you've been doing. You've been smoking crystal meth. Right. That's why you're skinny as a rail and you've got all these little holes in your face that you've picked away yep. and you have half your teeth gone. Right. Like, I'm not... Like, I can see these things. Some people can't see them, okay? Right. So you've got that picture. You've got the picture of the person who is apparently high or has been using drugs, and there's been this influence, okay? That's the negative. Right. And then you have someone that begins to shine like the stars in the sky as they hold on to the word of life. Right. Then you begin to have someone who is, the, hey, who is exactly what Jesus said, the salt of the earth. Right. The light of the world. Right. And you get, you get, I, I, ran, I ran into someone the other day and Gary, I was lost. I rolled down the window. He was, he had, he had some role with the police. He wasn't a police officer, but maybe he was, he was, he had a badge and everything. And I said to him, excuse me, I was using my old GPS in my car and I couldn't find the place I was looking for. Okay. And I was looking for some police office station. And he, I said, excuse me. Can you tell me where this location is? Uh, my GPS and my car is wrong. Okay. And he goes, Oh, all you have to do is go down this to this light, turn left, go all the way down. It's going to be right there on your left, but it's a one way street. So you're going to have to go around the block and make a little C and you're going to get it. And it's right here. And it looks like this. And I, I just wanted to blurt out to him. You're a Christian, aren't you? I knew. Right. I just knew he, he, what he had, uh, like, like he, like, like instead of being on crack, he was on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right, 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 right. And my dream for us, and I've seen this in you, and I, 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 I want people to see it in me, is that we submit our lives to God. Right. And he fills us with his Holy Spirit. Right. And that Jesus redeems us. And you've rightly said that it is a process. Right. Right. And we still need to repent and turn to him every day. Every day. But I want people to see us on Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Amen, brother. Is that good? That's good stuff. All right. Yeah. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you like this, please share it on the social media platforms that, uh, you know, you use. Uh, give us a like. Definitely just subscribe if you're listening to this on Spotify or you're listening to this on Bridgepoint uh, Valparaiso YouTube channel. And uh, as always, keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's follow him together. Amen. 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 Amen.